So I'm just going to present to you uh, GoCommerce insights into a prototype for a different headless e-commerce backend on the Jamstack. Take it away. Awesome. Thank you for the introduction. Yeah, we realized since I'm not on summertime yet, it's actually an hour earlier for me, which is really nice, uh, to be honest. Um, is the video coming through? I think the, the share works, right? Yes. Um, awesome. OK, yeah, hi. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the video platform, but I think there is a button in the outer lower right corner where you can kind of switch between the gallery view and my slides kind of in a, in a full screen, um, if you want to alternate that. Um, cool. Yeah, I'm going to talk about headless e-commerce in general and like a very specific uh, approach that we've been taking at Netlify. Uh, I'm Marcus. I've been working at Netlify for like one and a half years now. Um, I'm a backend engineer, um, mostly working in Rust and Go. I'm, I'm getting a lot of like just noise on the on the audio. Do you mind muting? Oh yeah, that's better. Awesome. Um, cool. Um, yeah. So as a backend engineer, I care about our CDN serving static files, executing functions, and kind of the all the glue um, around that. Um, so that's that's where I'm operating daily. I also like TypeScript, although I don't do it regularly. I think it's it's a really nice uh, technology in the, in the space we're in. Um, Netlify as a company is also hiring in a lot of positions. If you're interested, go to netlify.com slash careers, both en engineering and non-engineering roles. Um, my team in uh, specifically is also hiring for Rust and Go uh, developers. So if you know anybody um, who would like to work at Netlify, let them know. Cool. Uh, you can find me on GitHub and Twitter at Marino. Um, best to just type the thing. Um, cool. I think for any questions that you might have, it's fine to drop them into chat whenever they come up for you. I might answer them in between. I might answer them in the end. But if you put them into the chat, we can make sure that they get answered. Um, and of course, there's also like normal Q&A in the end. Cool. So um, I think we've already touched on the topic of Jamstack. Um, the important bit that I want to talk about is the decoupled infrastructure of Jamstack sites. So the basic principle that's really important uh, to this talk is that on a Jamstack site, you decouple the presentation layer, so what people also call the front end, from the back end uh, layer that kind of interacts with your data. Um, in many cases, this just means that your content is in some system that um, pushes into, um, like that notifies a build system of something changed. Then the build system will gather all the data together, build a new atomic version of your site, and push it out to a CDN or any kind of like a hosting system that can then serve your sites just based on purely static files. In many cases, that will not be kind of the sufficient way to do it for all sites. So a lot of sites actually need to have some interactivity to them um, so that they actually work uh, for their use case. So um, in many cases, on top of, generating those static files so that we have a site. We will also be executing JavaScript in the browser to actually go to some APIs or like just data endpoints in the end um, that give us this interactivity on top of um, the static files that we have in the site. And this is like important in a lot of cases. I think a, a, maybe a good example of a Jamstack site is actually if you go to the Netlify UI, um, you are using a Jamstack site because the Netlify UI is just a React app um, that interacts with our APIs that we build across a lot of different services um, to give you the management dashboard for the Netlify product. Um, and we do actually build Netlify on Netlify. So our Netlify UI actually uses Netlify under the hood to make uh, kind of um, that um, 
workflow that we build as a product kind of viable for ourselves. And so we, we also dog food our product a lot. Um, and I already, already mentioned this front end is then going to our backend APIs um, to kind of fill in the data that it needs for a specific users using the UI. Um, uh, and so it is, I think it is common for larger Jamstack sites to have multiple data sources, to not just have like a single thing that feeds the whole site, but you might have something that just has aesthetic content, but you also might have uh, an API that cares about, I don't know, comments on your blog post, an API that cares about, um, well, logging in and identity stuff. And this might be like a special API, so Netlify identity or all zero are examples for that. Um, and then there are other APIs, for example, headless e-commerce APIs. So if your site is an e-commerce site where you sell stuff, of course, you can't really sell stuff if there's just like a static site just giving you the products. You actually want to click a buy button and uh, actually want to have like a transaction going where you um, purchase the, the thing. And to do that, you need an API that is able to, that you're able to interact with JavaScript um, to actually make that transaction. And it's very likely that you'd also be using something like Stripe to handle the actual payments for you so that your headless e-commerce API does not need to concern itself with that because it's usually a good idea to kind of split the responsibilities in kind of the ways that the different services handle best. So I don't know, Stripe is known for, or PayPal is another example, um, they are known for being really good at handling payments. So you can kind of hand off that whole payment experience to them and you only need to kind of care about, okay, what does the ordering look like? Um, the ordering of products. And um, I think that's what I'm, what I want to dive into. So you probably know some headless e-commerce API if you're kind of active in like the intersection of Jamstack and e-commerce uh, use cases. Um, because there's a lot of like software as a service offerings that um, are in this niche and kind of offering stuff there because like the Jamstack has gained traction and with it, a lot of like of those headless APIs. Sorry. Okay, so let's look at what that kind of interaction will look like. So we mentioned that you usually on Jamstack side have a build system that builds your static files, and then you have a static site that people actually visit. Um, in our e-commerce use case, um, the build system will get its data from what we here just call an e-commerce API. So this is something that stores the info about, okay, what kind of products is your site offering? And then you can use the build system to kind of put your front end layer on top of that, compile all your like product presentation pages into the static site. Seems good because like that means you have like a shop site that is static that can be distributed around the globe, be del delivered with low latency, will not be subject to downtime if your e-commerce API goes down. That's that's a good architecture, I'd say. And it looks like um, this if somebody then kind of wants to uh, order something. So Let's say we have a website selling bikes and somebody comes to the website and wants to look at the products. They will just go to the static sites, be able to browse the products. This usually doesn't involve any kind of API requests because, well, we rendered all the products into the static site, so they're just available. It's a really fast site. They can just browse. Uh, it will be a good experience. When it comes to actually ordering uh, a bike, they will have to kind of do this interaction with uh, an API as I described before. So they will go to the e-commerce API in this case from the browser um, and kind of complete this trans transaction. So it's very simplified right here, but in the end, there's some transaction with this API going on, specifying what kind of products do I want to order um, and then somehow the order succeeds. There's usually more steps in it, but I think we can use the simplification for now. Looks good. Now means, okay, your e-commerce API is kind of the 
thing that is being interacted with from the outside as well. But it's kind of the single source of truth for your products and your orders and everything. That sounds fine. And it's the usual use case that people um, use on these on these kinds of scenarios where they want to have a jam sex hide that is actually like an online store. But I want to also talk about some failure cases because while this on like a whiteboard scenario might look pretty good, there's some things that can go wrong. For example, we have somebody like an editor who goes to this e-commerce API and will well, change a price, change a product, stuff like that. And with this kind of Jamstack architecture, we're kind of buying into the downside of whenever we make a change, it will take a bit to update the static site. That's kind of a, a known downside and something that in most cases we can accept. But in this case, it kind of shows some issue with um, our system because if we do that, if we change the price and then it takes some time to update the static site, what happens if in the meantime, somebody asks for, okay, I've seen this product on a static site with this price, but the price is actually not the price that we that our e-commerce API knows about because it has already been updated. In that case, there might be an error message saying, oh, well, the price that you're trying to pay is actually not the correct one. You're doing something wrong. This is, of course, something that you can usually um, fix by having the e-commerce API calculate the price and only giving SKUs. But like, if you're trying to order a product that just doesn't exist anymore because somebody deleted it, there's not really like a mitigation for that. Or at least it's kind of something you have to kind of pay forward uh, to, to manage this, ed this edge case um, properly. It might be fine in this period of the thing is building to have some weird behavior. But if you want to have like an online shop where the experience is really good, you probably want to avoid error cases where people need to retry their order. Another use case is if you're like a probably larger enterprise or some larger um, enterprise that's just moving into e-commerce and was probably non-e-commerce before or like um, is just has a legacy system that the products are stored in. Um, that means you would you have this this thing. There are different things. They're usually called like enterprise resource planning systems, which um, for some companies are like the um, source of truth for these are my products and how this is how much stock I have for them, stuff like that. And we usually, they, they don't offer ways to interact with from the web. So we would need to have some kind of uh, mechanism, but we could just use some APIs of that system to kind of tell the build system about all the products. That sounds fine, kind of like in the, in the previous example. And then the build system can just show all the products that are in the system on the static site. The e-commerce API, on the other hand, since we're kind of not making it the source of truth for the product, would then maybe need to always go to that system for all its info on like pricing and products, which means if your legacy ERP system is maybe hosted in-house, doesn't have a very good kind of uptime guarantee, your kind of uptime for people can order things is dependent on that legacy system, which is usually not a, like a good characteristic for your shop. And we, I only wrote SPOF, but it uh, stands for single point of failure. So um, in this scenario that I'm showing here, you would make the legacy ERP system your single point of failure, although not for the product, listing on your site, which are still rendered statically into the site, but for um, the ordering experience, which in the end makes you money. So you probably want to have that up all the time. Um, another case is, of course, you could still use the e-commerce API as the source of truth, but then you need to have some complex sync process that uh, makes sure that everything is always up to date. And there are, of course, <laughs> some drawbacks uh, of that as well. So this is kind of the, the context I want to give on kind of the problem space that we're exploring with um, the open source project that Netlify is calling GoCommerce, um, because we're doing a bit of a different approach to what's the single source of truth for your products. And 
The approach at first might seem a bit weird, but I'm going to dive into why it might actually be a good idea to go this route. So this is the architecture we're thinking of when you're using GoCommerce. GoCommerce as kind of the part that's called e-commerce API here, um, where we um, just manage the orders with. So if we are already putting our product info into the build system and building it into a static site, why don't we just ask the static site for what's the current price? Because our deploys are atomic, we're always kind of able to have like a consistent view across our whole site um, for what's the current info. So if this e-commerce API, in our case, GoCommerce, is able to get this data from the static site, we have a single source. So whatever the customer sees as prices and product info is what the e-commerce API will use for orders. So the pricing info is always up to date, and you're always able to order anything you see. Um, so in this case, the customer wants to order some bike. The e-commerce API would just go to the static site to ask for the price of this product. And this is the more kind of higher level overview of this concept. So if you want to involve your legacy ERP system in that, it only needs to inform the build system of, OK, here are the products that I want to have. And uh, if your le legacy ERP system is down, well, your builds will fail, but your site will still be up. Your site will still be functioning. There's no impact on the uptime of your site. And um, so the, the, the critical path all happens on the right here. The customer is able to get the products from the static side. It's able to put orders in in the e-commerce API. And the e-commerce API just goes to the static side for info on the products, um, which works around the single point of failure issue and also this kind of two-way sync problem that you might have had before. Um, so if you're not using this legacy ERP system, we actually do have customers that just use Netlify CMS for the part of, OK, how do I manage my products? Um, because in the end, your products just become could just become Markdown documents with some front matter, or could just become JSON documents or YAML documents in your Git repository if your catalog is not growing too large. Um, that is totally fine to just manage in Git. And Netlify CMS is uh, a good workflow to just use the GitHub API um, to manage uh, your, your content for your site. And so you don't even have to host any system that keeps track of your products. You can just use Git for as the single source of truth for all content of your site, depending on how large your site is, of course. <laughs> um, and nothing else about the architecture changes. So you can actually migrate the source of truth for your products uh, easily, because all you need to do is like tell your build system, OK, go to something else. And you can also like purposely, purposefully stop your build system while you're doing the migration without even like impacting your site at all. It's like a. Um, good way of really making use of that decoupling principle um, that I've talked about earlier. OK, how does GoCommerce actually do it? So I've now drawn a bunch of diagrams that promised some things, but how does it actually work? Um, so this is an example of a re request to the GoCommerce API. Um, this would be done from the front end, so the front end application does a fetch request with a post method to the slash orders endpoint and says, OK, I want to please buy these items with these quantities. And my email is this. Email, of course, is not the only thing we want to know about the customer usually. So there might be more metadata, but that's kind of the, the gist of it. Like we need some, we need to have like a, a representation of the shopping cart and some personal info about uh, who's buying. And after that's happened, um, the GoCommerce API will actually calculate the pricing of your card um, for you. So what it will do to get the pricing of your whole order is it will do an HTTP request to your static site, and it will find snippets like this in your static site. This is something you, of course, need to configure your static site generator to uh, output. But this is all you basically need to put as metadata into your static site next to however you're presenting uh, your product in your um, HTML. Um, 
just to make it work with GoCommerce. So in, in this case, um, you have like a specific class. I think the class is different for GoCommerce. This is just an example, but you have a specific class on a script element that has a type application JSON, not JS, it's JSON. So it's never gonna be executed by the browser, um, but it contains the metadata for a product. And the important bit is that we're always identifying this metadata object by an SKU. So the SKU of, of course needs to be unique across your site so that there aren't any clashes and GoCommerce finds two different prices for a single SKU. Um, but it, in general, GoCommerce just uses the first one it finds. So it won't break anything, but you need to kind of ensure that you're not getting weird things if you have uh, clashing SKUs. Um, but, and then you just put the price on it. Uh, it's a bit simplified here. It's uh, just the price in cents. So that makes like five euros or $5. Uh, in reality, you can actually have a price for different currencies as well. So you can have a, like a price object that says, okay, in US dollars, this is that, that many cents, in euros, this is that many cents and so forth. So um, on the order um, that GoCommerce receives, it can actually also receive a, a currency and then it will go to the meta, it will fetch the metadata for the product for the right currency and then calculate for with with the right currency information this also extends to like texting information so uh, vat or other texting systems um, work with that just by adding the right metadata in here and i imagine it's pretty easy for your static site generator to output this info because i'm pretty sure your static site generator already has that info in some way uh, like that so like if you have a front matter in your markdown you could probably just have a front matter object that says, okay, like GoCommerce info, and then you have these uh, properties in there, or you are, are already, already using SKUs um, in your kind of overall system, and you can just make sure to render out that data with your process. So when whatever, if you're using like Hugo or Gatsby or Next.js, would probably be possible to just render out some JSON into the HTML. Okay. Now we can dive a bit into the front end code. Because in the end, that's what people will do because GoCommerce in itself is like a API that you just use. But um, we also have like a JavaScript SDK that um, ensures that you don't need to kind of just call the API endpoints uh, like in a, in a basic sense, but you, you also already get like a higher level kind of SDK to make some of these things easier. This is a specific flow for, okay, I wanna make an order and I will also wanna pay for it because GoCommerce splits the ordering and the payment parts, which means that you can actually choose which kind of payment provider you wanna use because GoCommerce is not agnostic to the payment provider, but supports a variety and the customer can actually just choose the payment provider on checkout um, because these are different actions. First, there's the action of, okay, I wanna make an order. This is what kicks off, okay, I'm calculating a price and um, this is the price I'm putting kind of on the order and then the order is pending. So then I want people to actually then pay for the order. And once they've paid for the order, um, the database entry is marked differently. So some fulfillment system in the, uh, that's kind of querying, that would be querying that data would also be able to just get the uh, orders that have actually been paid, for example. And in this case, the payment works in a way that you then, after you did the ordering, you get like an amount back from the API saying, okay, this is how much you need to pay. You can then use, for example, Stripe or PayPal to, um, get like a pre-authorized transaction. Um, so you make like a, there's, there's a front end flow for most of these providers where they then put in their credit cards and that credit card data never actually touches any of your system. So you don't need to be like PCI compliant because that payment data is always gonna stay in that payment provider uh, and they are gonna handle it for you. So Stripe and PayPal have like front ends for that. And they will give you a token that you can then use in your backend to actually fulfill the transaction. So the user only gives confirmation for the um, uh, transaction. And if for some reason your backend fails, it can either say, okay, yeah, 
well, I didn't do that payment, so then PayPal will never really charge the user, or it can actually retry it because this token can be kind of used multiple times and Stripe and PayPal will detect if the payment with that token has already been made and just say, okay, yeah, it has been paid, fine, you're good. And, and that makes for really resilient uh, infrastructure, both for your front end, where you can just retry on like flaky connections, and but also for your back end, if you're kind of in the middle of deploying GoCommerce and it, the one API call might fail, you can just do the next one, it will just work um, if you retry the request from the front end. Cool. Um, I've talked about a lot of things that it can support. It has some more things it can support. We also have a UI element that's called gocommerce-admin. That's a React UI that uses the gocommerce API to give admins uh, an overview of orders and um, users and fulfillment info. So you can actually kind of make this a very like light uh, fulfillment dashboard where you say, okay, I want to see all the orders that have been paid. And once I fulfill them, I'm going to click on the order and say, okay, I've now fulfilled this order. And um, then you have like a very basic tracking system for your orders if you need to. Of course, this integrates with uh, something like Netlify functions. So um, GoCommerce has a built-in primitive for calling webhooks for certain actions that happen. So whenever a new order was made or um, when an order was actually fulfilled or when a payment was made, it can call certain webhooks. And those webhooks could be Netlify functions that you use to extend what GoCommerce does with your own business logic that you need to do. So maybe you want to send an email once the order has gone through, or you want to, I don't know, send your fulfillment provider some information, and this all is able to work with webhooks. Um, it also integrates with um, JWTs, so um, stateless authentication tokens, um, for example, issued via GoTrue, which is the backend of our identity offering. Um, but of course, also any other like JWT system like Auth0 would work for identifying customers um, and giving them kind of a view of their past orders via the API if they are successfully identified. Um, it can also do signed download URLs. So once kind of an order for like a digital product has gone through um, on your GoCommerce instance, it can be hooked up to something like an S3 bucket um, and it can generate signed URLs for stuff in that S3 bucket so that you can then have like limited lifetime URLs that you can give to somebody to um, download stuff, but they can't kind of hand out these URLs to, to, to more people because the URL will have expired and kind of only the people that have actually bought a digital product will be able to download it. And of course, if I don't know, there's some irregularity and you need to kind of cancel an order. People will also not be able to download something again because GoCommerce will not give them a signed URL if the order has been revoked. Cool. Um, I think that's what I have about it. And I'm really excited for your questions. Thanks so much, Marcus. That was really interesting. Um, I have a ton of questions, but I want to, before I start uh, hopping in my mind, I want to open up the floor to some other folks. So do people have questions for Marcus? See some things in the chat saying, nice job. Okay, so Selene has a question here, Marcus, that says, and this is in the chat if you want to read it. It says, what are the limitations of Git? How many products or product variants can my Git hold? Uh, and how does Smashing Magazine do it? Yeah, so, um, well, I, I can't talk about a lot of internals here, but um, I think I'd call it a good use case if you have like a limited amount of products. So something in the range of 100 to 1,000 products, I think above that, handling it in Git becomes really hard and kind of, your Git repository has some limits as well as like the time it takes to for people to check it out. So you probably at some point will need to kind of separate your front end uh, Git uh, repository from your, like your content Git repository. And then you need to find a way to actually have both changes in both of them trigger a build. So it becomes a bit more complex. And I think that's one of the downsides of the GoCommerce model that 
it actually right now doesn't support, well, it, it doesn't care about where it's stored. So theoretically, you could just use something like Contentful to store your products, render them into your static sites, and GoCommerce wouldn't care because it only goes to the static site for um, that content. So whatever headless API, so I know people also like to use uh, other systems nowadays than Contentful, like uh, I think Strapi and stuff like that. So um, if you're kind of outgrowing Git, you can always move to like a headless uh, CMS provider that gives you kind of the scale and maybe also like the UX for your editors um, to, to get their work done properly. But as I've said before, switching that is a zero downtime operation because it only relies on your static site for the um, operation of GoCommerce. Great. And Slane also writes here, uh, how feasible is GoCommerce with Plenty right now? So Plenty, if you're not familiar, that's a static site generator that I'm actually building and it has a, a go back and a Svelte front end, but basically everything lives in a JSON data source. So I assume it basically, you know, whether the data source is JSON or YAML or, or what have you, it, it basically all feeds off of your static site generator content source, right? So as long as you can make your HTML include a snippet like this, which mm -hmm. is only JSON as well, it will be fine. So you should be able to kind of attach this metadata or derive it from your product, and then you should be good. Great. How do you compare, um, Mark, Marcus, great, great presentation, by the way, very uh, very thorough, very informative. How do you, how do you kind of compare the Go Commerce approach to something like, um, you know, like a snip cart or something like that? Um, I think it's pretty similar. I think something like someone from Snipcard could have told you nearly the same things that I told you today. I'm not too familiar with a lot of e-commerce stuff. I don't do that on a daily basis. So I mostly know about our own system here and some of the adjacent big players in, in the market. Um, my understanding of Snipcard is that it gives you kind of the JavaScript SDK to like easily integrate with your site for the like card and checkout workflow. And it in some way gathers info on the products to actually be able to calculate the right price to charge you. But I'm not really sure how that works with Snipcard. So if it works the same way, that's awesome. I haven't really used it. Cool. Thank you. Marcus, I had a question about uh, so the stock of an item. So I assume that you'd keep track of, so say we had uh, 10 available widgets to sell and we want to keep track of how many we had left. I assume we'd keep track of that in our markdown source. And then basically once a, a purchase was made, we would run one of those functions, like you said, there's, there's hooks for functions. And then that would go back and update our markdown source. Is that how that workflow would generally work? Yeah, I think that's, an interesting question. Um, I, I actually have a code snippet that illustrates that a bit. So I'm going to share that one second. Um, what's the thing called? One second. This should be the one. OK, so this is from another presentation I've done in GoCommerce that focused on a bit more kind of the, the usage of it. And I had an example here that is kind of able to illustrate this. This is not an actual feature of GoCommerce, but I could imagine it working like that. So GoCommerce knows which product, which things you have ordered in the past. So it, because it keeps track of all the orders and all the SKUs in those orders. So if you're able to kind of have your system that has like the authoritative data on what your stock is, just output this snippet of, okay, I had this much stock at this point, GoCommerce would then be able to like look at the orders that have been done from that point on and say, okay, from that point on, now you have that much stock left because I know how many of those products have been ordered since that point. And it would be able to just have an API endpoint that tells you the stock for a certain item that's currently available. Um, and also maybe prohibit you from ordering something that's out of stock. Um, 
just because it has this order history that it would be able to look it up in. But it's not an actual feature. It's something that could work like this. It's an open source project. You're happy to. You're welcome to uh, contribute. Oh, that's super interesting. So is it? And correct me if I'm wrong. So it's kind of like a hybrid approach where it gets the initial stock from that markdown data source, and then from there it keeps track of that information in its own database, and it, it makes sure that it doesn't exceed that original stock amount. Is that? Correct? Yeah. So. The idea is that your stock will always be like based on some external factor, like something that's going on in your warehouse. So you're not able to like update it in real time usually. You're only updated to like once a day or every few hours based on what your workflow looks like. So if you're then whenever you get that update, you're kind of putting that into your markdown. You obviously need to have a timestamp of okay. This info was valid at this point. And yeah, as you said, then GoCommerce will, will be able to keep track of it. But it's not something that GoCommerce needs to put in its database. GoCommerce can, on every order, just go to the site, read this metadata, compare it with how many orders have been done from that point on with this product included, and then calculate, OK, this is the current amount for it. It doesn't actually need to um, do any database uh, stuff for that. That's very cool. And then in terms of like how, so so obviously when you have a front end app, uh, it sometimes you know there's security things that you have to account for. Um, so people aren't manipulating things on the front end. And, and you might've touched on this a little bit, but is GoCommerce, so I know GoCommerce is getting that information all from like the, the JavaScript front end integration. Is it actually going and crawling those endpoints to make sure that those prices are valid and they, they haven't been manipulated by someone before they've been sent to go commerce, or how does that work? Yeah, that's a good point. I think I'm just going to back, switch back to my original slides um, to get just get the right metadata up. Um, so, I think the important point here is that the way GoCommerce gathers this, because I haven't really talked about it much, but the idea is that GoCommerce knows what your kind of site URL is. So if, you're, if, if you would have integrated GoCommerce with Netlify, it's not something we offer publicly. But um, if you would integrate GoCommerce with Netlify, you would have a proxy rule from the CDN that goes to the GoCommerce uh, backend service and tells it, OK, I've proxied you an API request for this site with this domain. So it also would work for like deploy previews, where you would actually want to have like a different database for your deploy previews because that's like a staging environment where you have like dummy tokens that work instead of just like your production. So you had, could have like context sensitive uh, proxying would be possible in, in that uh, regard. Um, but in any case, that proxying would be able to transport um, to the GoCommerce backend, OK, this is the URL for the site. And GoCommerce will only go to that specific URL that the system told it this is the like authoritative source for where the content is. And it will not actually execute JavaScript. It will only read the HTML and parse these things out of it. So it wouldn't really work with the React front end because that only has a, a diff where your React renders into. But it would need something that actually generates the static HTML for this, like Gatsby, like Next.js, like other static site generators that really produce static stuff. and. This is, of course, only safe if you use HTTPS, but HTTPS is basically like a pre-requirement for everything we do nowadays with the Jamstack. So um, as long as that is kind of fulfilled, you don't really have a way as an outside person to manip manipulate where GoCommerce is going to, because this is not happening in the JavaScript SD SDK, but the backend API is actually doing an extra HTTP request to your site, and that's always considered kind of safe. Great, thank you. I want to give a second for other. I, I have I have a couple more questions, but I want to give a, a second for other folks just in case. Um, so, 
I have a question about, uh, I have a few, but um, one about discounts. Is, is discounts something that would be possible with GoCommerce and what would that look like? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, yeah, there's actually some code in GoCommerce supporting discounts. Um, for some limited use cases, I think it works well. The way that it's modeled works in a way that the JWT that somebody is authenticated with can have some metadata saying, okay, this user is actually kind of in a user group that receives a discount, for example, or you could just have a discount code. Um, the way this kind of sourcing of what kind of discounts should we apply to what kind of products and orders is a bit complicated, but basically, um, GoCommerce allows you to put metadata into this metadata object saying, okay, anybody uh, with, I don't know, this kind of JWT metadata is able to get like a 50% discount on this product. Stuff like this, I think. It, it might not be in that metadata, but that you're able to kind of put some metadata in your site saying, okay, these are the like discounts for, uh, for different products. And um, I think the way this works right now is that you actually put a JSON in your site that also has like the coupon codes and kind of the member discounts and everything. And you actually protect that with like basic auth um, thing. So I don't know, but uh, on Netlify, um, you, can, you can do like per path basic auth to the underscore headers file. So you could protect this path from like usual people on the internet and just give GoCommerce kind of the, the HTTP basic auth credentials for getting your coupons and your discount codes. And um, then it would also be able to get that info from, uh, from your static site, which is good because then you can manage it to a CMS and just publish it to, new, to your static site. You don't need to care about like another source of truth that you manage somewhere else, but it's actually just like, your CMS system can manage those codes and your editors can just add new campaigns in your CMS system and it will render into your static sites and GoCommerce reads from that. I think we apply some caching because like fetching that every time is pretty heavy. Um, but yeah, that's the general idea. That's very cool. Um, and, and another question I had was, uh, so I, I was familiar or at least with the concept of, so there's the GoCommerce kind of microservice backend that's written in Go. And then there was a project, I think it was GoCommerce JS possibly is the name of it, but I think you mentioned it. And that's, that's what you would put in your static site to kind of help facilitate the, like the shopping cart functionality, that kind of thing. Is that true? Yeah, so I don't think it's as advanced as like something like the Snipcart SDK. Sure. But um, it's, a basic JavaScript library that allows you to say, okay, I have a button for putting a product into my cart. And that button then only needs to call into the SDK and the SDK will keep track of the card. And um, then you can have like, um, of course, a card that can be rendered from output from that SDK. And also you can have a buy button that just tells the SDK, okay, whatever you have in your cart right now, you can you should now go to the GoCommerce API and prepare an order, tell me the price for it, and then somebody will um, make the, do the payment flow and then actually initiate a payment with that. I think that's kind of what I showed here. It, it's similar to that, it's not exactly that, but it, you can imagine it being similar to that. And so it should make for not that much JavaScript that you have to write yourself for your own store. That's that's great. Okay, very cool. And then there's a third project that you mentioned that I, I wasn't aware of. I think you called it the admin UI. And this that sounds like that's uh, maybe a React or some kind of JavaScript extension of the actual Go Commerce Go project that's giving you um, some information into like your you know your current orders and, and workflows and things. Now is that, um, first of all, is there like a link or something like that to that project? And then um, when you have that set up, does that actually, is it mostly informational or does it actually let you provide like sort of like CRUD type uh, functions on your, I guess that wouldn't make sense because it's all coming from your, your content source anyways. So I'm just kind of curious how that works and what that looks like. So this is the GitHub repo. It's open source. I linked it in the chat. Okay. Um, it's a very basic React UI and 
it's not something we're actively pursuing, but like people could extend it. Um, but the general idea is for this to not manage your product cat catalog because the product catalog is usually something that's more of like that people with like an editor role will kind of manage that with a different life cycle than you would manage your orders that your users make. So while your product catalog might change like once every day or like once every week, people are constantly making orders. So this is the specific interface for people that care about fulfillment and maybe your support persons for your shop or like anybody who needs to interact with like the day to day of um, keeping a shop running, which is mostly focused around, okay, I have some orders and uh, I need to fulfill them or do something with them. Uh, or I just want to have like an overview of what are people ordering. And so this UI, it's kind of sad that there's not really a screenshot here. I'm not sure if we actually have something like that right now. Um, but yeah, um, it's it's a very basic UI that just gives you like a table view of all your orders and you can then kind of change some properties about the order, like if you have fulfilled it or something. And it just uses the GoCommerce API um, with like an admin token. So you, you can specify a certain role that your JWT token should have and then you're able to use kind of that API to get all the orders from all users itself, just the orders for your own user. That's that's very cool. I I feel like the you, you and your team have put a tre tremendous amount of work into all these projects. I think it's really cool. Um, I'm excited to play around with it. I hope some other people will find this video and, and make some more examples too to just like make the whole thing even more streamlined. I found uh, before this call, I was looking around for some examples, and I uh, I saw that Matt had posted some, but I also saw that there was one I think called Jam Com Jam Commerce or something like that. That was an example that looked like a an implementation of Go Commerce on the back end that potentially people can look at for an example. I don't know if you have any examples or, or good starting points for people who are trying to dive in for the first time to to get up and running. Is, is there any guides or anything like that that you'd recommend? Yeah, I think that's a tough one because, um, yeah, we haven't really put a lot of time into that project in the last few years, I think, because like it hasn't really been the focus of Netlify. It didn't turn out that like a headless e-commerce API is something we want to focus on as a product. So because like there's a whole market for it with people that focus on it like specifically, and Netlify as a platform more wants to kind of um, integrate with other platforms than just like provide this out of the box. So it didn't really make sense to kind of pursue that on our own. I'm not sure there might be community stuff, but we haven't really made a lot of kind of example sites for this. Um, so yeah, um, I'm, I'm not aware of any. I think it's, uh, it's viable to play around with it. I think it's actually um, if, if we talk about kind of hosting this, because in the end, Netlify does not offer like a hosted GoCommerce, so you would be able to, you would need to kind of host this for yourself, this backend, and it needs some kind of SQL database, so MySQL or Postgres in the best case. So I'd usually um, recommend people to just host it on uh, Heroku because um, it's, it's just Go, it should be pretty easy to run on Heroku. You could just use the built-in database that they offer and you should be up and running in like literally very little time. Um, and then, yeah, then you can start experimenting with it. And if you put like a underscore redirects rule inside of your Netlify site, um, you also kind of get a very like neat integration with your with your Netlify site because you could then kind of based on if you're in production or in a deploy for review, like proxy to different environments in your Heroku deployment. And uh, I think a Heroku deployment comes really close to what we would do internally when hosting that service. Awesome, thanks for the advice on that. Does, does anyone have any final questions? Uh, it's very late for Marcus, so we'll give them their, their night back. So uh, if anyone has any final questions, we'll field those and otherwise we'll conclude the meeting and I'll stop the recording.
not exactly a question, but just just um, just a comment about something that that we're working on. I, I found this really interesting because one of the things that we're doing at, at Take Shape is trying to figure out how to um, be an API mesh for different kinds of APIs. One of that being one of those categories being e-commerce APIs. Um, and so I think your your the solution that you presented with GoCommerce is really interesting. Um, you know, I. Uh, it, it's not a question, but but rather a comment to say, like, I think I think it's fascinating to see the different kinds of ways that people are solving these problems. And, you know, that what you guys have come up with and what Snipcart has come up with is really fascinating. And, you know, the I guess I'll throw it out into the world just to say that, like, the the way that we've thought about this is is at another like one step back from the static site and the API, but being kind of a a. a a player, uh, a system that sits in between kind of the client and and the e-commerce API and content API to give users this like unified view of what a product is um, through a through just a GraphQL API. So I think it's, but I think it's really interesting to see you know how, how you guys have have come about solving it. So I'm very curious to to see where it goes. And I think. Um, I think you. I think you guys have like an e-commerce event coming up in May, right? Just as another Jamstack event. I think there's there's yeah, like a Netlify, the, Netlify e-commerce. The in team May. is the team is doing that once a year to kind of host the ecosystem around the e-commerce on the Jamstack. Um, yeah, there's something coming up around that. I don't have any further info, but it should be called something like a headless e-commerce summit or something. Um, yeah, I think um, on that on the note of kind of integrating APIs with uh, each other. Um, the interesting thing that comes up on our side around that, which we're working really hard on, is edge handlers. Um, so giving people this like middleware ability inside of the Netlify Edge um, to run like JavaScript to like aggregate stuff from different sources uh, on mm -hmm. the fly while the request is kind of ongoing. And so I hope that in a in a few weeks, you'll have uh, you you will be able to take like a look at the public beta of that. Cool. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks so much, Marcus. Really appreciate you staying on late with us, and uh, we'd thanks love to have you back. Yeah. So anytime. Uh, this was a great presentation. I learned a ton, and I'm actually really excited to dive into the code base a little bit and try to implement something in GoCommerce very soon. So. <laughs> I'll let you know if I do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sounds great. Cool, great. awesome. Great. Thanks for attending, everyone. We'll Thank you, Marcus. Good night. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Thank you.